Finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble for me, and it is a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision, who worship in the Spirit of God and take pride in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself could boast as having confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he is confident in the flesh, I have more reason. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, these things I have counted as loss because of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in the view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them mere rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. If somehow I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, <coughs> not that I have already grasped it all, or have already become perfect, but I press on, if I may also take hold of that for which I was even taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I do not regard myself as having taken hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward that lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, all who are mature, let's have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that to you as well. However, let's keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. Brothers and sisters, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have had in us. For many walk of whom I have often told and now tell you, even as I weep, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who have their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom will transform the body of our lowly condition into conformity with his glorious body, by exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Amen. Amen. Love Philippians. Lovely. Father God, um, what a, a revelation the Bible is to each and every time we read it, and what it shows us in life as to how to follow you, Father, how to be of you. <coughs> Father, I pray this morning that when Paul speaks, he will give us that route through to you even more so, Father, that we can love you even more. Because, Father, we know that you love each and every one of us here this day. And I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit will dwell on each and every one of us. Mm. Just bless this morning, Father. Mm. And, Father, we pray a blessing upon Paul as he brings your word to us this morning. Amen. 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 Thanks. Wonderful. Wow. That's great. Uh, that was uh, another time of being in God's presence, wasn't it? 
Was that? Yes. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So, uh, chapter 3 of uh, Philippians. And um, those of you who don't know your way around the Bible, really, uh, this is one of the churches that Paul wrote to, uh, giving them instruction as it relates to um, best practice, how to live right and, and sustain the right pathway. So the backdrop behind this is that Paul is wanting to encourage them to walk right and grasp hold of the truth. So he starts off by saying, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. And the, the reality of um, joy, uh, we're all seeking to be happy. We're all seeking to know joy. We're all seeking to embrace things. But true joy ultimately can only be found in God. Everything else is superficial. It's circumstantial. It's based upon what's going on good for us and if we are those who are driven by only being joyful in the good times then we haven't tapped in yet to the precious power that God has released in us as it relates to connecting to joy in trials and so learning to find joy in a trial is the reality of true joy and when people know you're in a trial and yet you're still filled with joy there's something about you as a person that becomes very contagious and irresistible. The beauty of God is seen in the, sometimes the most darkest moments of our lives. And so we are not dependent upon uh, the limitations of the circumstances that are working positively for us. Because that's just a superficial joy. Real joy is to know truth. Real joy is to know truth, mm. and we know that the truth will set us free. Mm. And the reason why it sets us free is because it releases us despite the circumstances. So we're not controlled or manipulated by the winds and the waves of life, because we have something far greater even in our storms. Oh, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And that sense of knowing God in your trials and your tribulations is an incredibly important thing to grasp. Otherwise, what will happen in your natural, you will throw the baby out with the bathwater. You will throw your rattle out of the plan every time things go wrong as a Christian. But we're not supposed to live in that way any longer. That's how we used to live. So Paul wants them to know what true joy is. And he says, brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. In the Lord is where we find the strength to get through the journey of life. He says it's a safeguard for you. And true safety is when you are at peace within yourself in God. When you have learned to be at peace in yourself, within yourself, in God. That's true safety. You're not, you're not safe because you've got a good pension. Well, you know, you're safe. It's not even uh, how many bolts that you put on the door of your heart. That's not true safety. You know, many people are hurt. And so they've bolted themselves up well and truly good so that no intruder can come. And because it's true, the little pig, little pig does want to let it come in. The bad little pig, I mean. And he does want to come and take control and make, manipulate your lives. And many of us have put on bolts and locks inside of our door because we think if we could just bolt up our hearts then we won't get damaged. But that's not how God wants us to live. To know life in all its fullness is to be liberated from every facet of life that robs us from the peace in the trials and the tribulations that we face every day. God wants us to live, not to die, even though we're alive. He wants us to live. And I ask you as a challenge question right from the beginning, are you alive? I mean, you might want to give someone a nudge next to you just to make sure they are really alive. But you wouldn't know even if you know them when they move because sometimes people are dead inside. Brothers and sisters, one of the great things about the gospel is that God has come to make us alive inside. And that means we can have all of our doors open and welcome him in to the most inner precious things of who we are. We don't need to live with a heart that's bolted up from the inside. He says, beware of the dogs. And that is all of your enemies. And there are many dogs out there that want to be your enemy and that want to steal from you and kill you and rob you of all the good things. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of them because they will try to proactively 
draw you into the wrong that they themselves are doing. You know, birds of a feather flock together, we used to say. And there's a sense in which, you know, uh, the, the, the child stands before the judge and the judge, the, the barrister's defence is that he got in with the wrong crowd. And that idea of getting in with the wrong crowd is beware of the evil workers, practices, practices of doing wrong, those who give themselves over to the deeds of darkness. We are called to be those who are walking right, not wrong. Beware of the full circumcision, he says. And the full circumcision, brothers and sisters, is all the add-ons. The add-ons to the gospel. The, you know, if you have to do this plus the gospel, they're the add-ons. And they were being challenged to be circumcised and to obey the Jewish law. But, you know, there were add-ons in our culture as well. You know, you have to do this and you have to do that. And you have to jump through these hoops. They're the add-ons. And God has not wanted us to get involved in any add-ons. The gospel <coughs> is a gospel that invites us to come and share our lives with God, our Father, and then to enter into a relationship with a world that we live in, that we might have unity amongst our fellow man and live and bring peace into every moment. We don't want to get caught up in add-ons. They will rob us of the innocence of the gospel. Who are the true circumcision? Those who worship in spirit, the Spirit of God and walk in the Spirit of truth. They're the true circumcision. They're those who have had their hearts circumcised by the Word of God, who have surrendered to God. You'll appreciate these are called, I've named this kind of little teaching, uh, Cherries from the Pauline Cherry Tree. And so I'm not going to hang around. I could preach a, a message on every one of these, but I'm not. I'm going to give you some cherries from the Pauline Cherry Tree from the book of Philippians, chapter 3. And so he says, those who worship in the Spirit of God and walk with the Spirit. And Galatians tells us that if we walk by the Spirit, we will not satisfy the desires of the flesh. And our flesh is in opposition to the things of God. And we're learning to bring back that flesh of us in line with the will of God. Who take pride in Christ Jesus. That is where their confidence is. Is your confidence in your next Bible study? Is your confidence in the fact that you can tick every Sunday you go to church? Is your confidence in the fact that you're generous in your giving and you're get generous in your serving? And if your confidence is in these things, they're works, they're add-ons, they're not going to help you. We need to have confidence in God, in the Gospel, have faith in the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Get away from add-ons who take pride in Christ Jesus. That is, they have confidence. Their confidence is in him. Who put no confidence in the flesh, send themselves into a purgatory. The first time I realised, I thought I understood grace. I even wrote a little book once called Grace. And it's, uh, I tried to get it sorted out. And, um, but when I, 35 years later, when I kind of really understood what grace was, I realised how little of grace I really knew when I wrote that book. And I was really praising the Lord that it never got published. But the reality of grace, you know, this unmerited favour that God has given to us. God gives us what we don't have to do what we can't do and be what we can't be. You know, the enemy of the gospel is our attempts to win God's favour in our own merit. And that's an unhealthy journey to go on. And I was on that journey, longing to be free, not realising that it was actually binding me in every possible way. There was a, you'll remember Thomas the Tank Engine, those of you that uh, watch TV, uh, in the uh, 80s and 90s. And there was a guy called the Fat Controller. And uh, he was an interesting, I bless you, man. And he was an interesting man from the point of view that he gave himself to... Um, being, as it were, the one that was important, giving out all the instructions. And he used to tell all the tank engines to do this and to do that. And the thing with the fat controller is, whatever the tank engines did, like Percy took the line up to, the main line up to London on an occasion. And uh, when he came back, he asked, how did I do? And the fat controller said, you did okay. Maybe you can do better tomorrow. 
And that's how I lived. I lived under the always trying to have to do more. But the gospel isn't about what you do, what you contribute, how much more you can do. The gospel comes freely. It's not striving to get God to like you. God has already decided to like you, to love you, to die for you, to give himself. He gave the very best he had to save you from everything that would rob you of relationship with him. And it was only when I realised that I was being driven by the fact of God that I understood finally what grace was, unmerited favour. God gives me, Paul, what I don't have to do, what I can't do. He provides for me. God's willingness to get involved in my life. And brothers and sisters, God's willingness to get involved in your life as well. To restore the years the locusts have eaten. Although I myself could boast, says the Apostle Paul, as having confidence in the flesh. And remember, Paul was heading, I believe, to high priest. He was on his journey up, the religious journey to the top. And he was committed in every way. And we see the dedication and the commitment of Paul's life as a Christian. And that would have been directed towards his religious journey. He was a passionate man pursuing the things of God. Except he was on the wrong train. And when he finally got on the right train and he was there working with God, he says, I could put, I could put my faith in the flesh. He says, he says, I was circumcised of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, Pharisee, dedicated keeper of the law, as to zeal, persecutor of the church. I tried to destroy it. As to the righteousness of the law, I was found blameless, says the Apostle Paul. Found blameless. Who could say that of the law? And yet there he is. He said, but I put no confidence in all of those things. But whatever things were gained to me, that was the gain he gained, that I thought brought me into a right standing before God. In, in these things, in these things, he says, I count but loss. What he's saying is that they got in the way and they will get in the way. Every attempt we have to appease God with anything that we contribute will get in the way. It's an add-on to everything that God has given already. Unless we come and receive by grace, we cannot receive the intimacy of a father's relationship. He says, I put my trust in knowing Christ as my Saviour and my Lord. What does it mean to be found in him, he asks. It means that when God comes looking for me on judgment day to judge me for the life that I live, he will do so on the basis of my trust in Jesus as my saviour. When God comes looking for me. And where will God find me when he comes looking for me? On that judgment day, Paul says, God will find me hidden in Jesus. And brothers and sisters, will God find you hidden in Jesus? Or will you try to appease him with all of the good things and the add-ons of life? Paul is saying, lay down the add-ons. They're going to wear you out. They won't get you where you need to get to. You need to come through grace. Only through grace can you obtain the inheritance as a saint. Not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, he says. But that which I is through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. A righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Without faith it is impossible to please God. Jesus Christ died on the cross to save us from our sins. As his blood was shed upon that cross, that blood washes away all of our confessed sin. God has already done it. All he's looking for is us to confess our sins. And then the promise in John is, he, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. That's the promise of grace given to us. And that's true for always, every committed sin. Come to God. Don't go to sleep tonight knowing you are in a bad place in terms of an unconfessed sin. Let your heart be cleansed by the precious, precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. That's victory over sin, death and decay. The power of his resurrection is victory over death. Sometimes life feels like death, doesn't it? Life feels like we're in a mush or poison. But God wants to bring us through into victory. And in fact, as Christians, God has given us the clear directives in regards to how we get the victory. But for Christians, for so long, we find ourselves living in the add-ons of life, trying to get into the victory. But God has already given us the victory. And the power of his resurrection is that victory over sin, death and decay. We don't have to live driven by a nature that was in rebellion to God, inherited from Adam, from the garden's rebellion. We don't have to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil anymore. We can eat from the tree of life. The inheritance of life has been given back to us. As if we had never sinned, Jesus' blood has washed away our inappropriateness. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. I am a spiritual being story, is what I wrote down here. And it was years later that I have always known myself within myself as a person spiritually connected to myself. And I would, even as a child, I would spend time talking to who I am. I didn't understand it fully. I never registered how it all kind of technically worked. Perhaps I thought I was contemplations of my thoughts and my mind. And it was years and years into Christianity. I've been a Christian nearly 50 years now. And it was years and years into Christianity when I finally understood something that I'd always lived in a known but never had any intellectual capability of understanding so that I could explain it in any particular purposeful way. And then I listened to a story from a guy called Kenneth Hagin. Now, lots of people don't like Kenneth Hagin and there's a lot of issues as it relates to all sorts of things. But nevertheless, on this particular day, Kenneth told a story. And he explained in a very simple way the reality of what it means to be a spiritual being, to have a soul and to live in a body. And then from that teaching, something exploded in my heart. And I began to go on a journey. And I began to understand how God meant us as human beings. And it was so simple and so clear. And it was so dependent upon all the things that I'd read about for years and years and years in the scriptures. And it changed my life, and it began to change my life. And the last 35, 40 years of that life, previous to our teaching and our understanding from Kenneth, I'd been striving to be a good boy, to live right, to do it right. But after that, oh, the striving stopped. And the peace came, and the understanding began to form in me. And life began to make sense. And all of a sudden I realised I'd stumbled across the pathway that leads us into the reality of the victory of the resurrection that we have, that the, Jesus, that the Lord Jesus brought us into. A fellowship with God that was incredible. Somehow I always knew about that, but it was through this teaching of Kenneth's that I understood and went on that journey. And I began to enable myself to explain it to myself. If you like, the penny dropped. The penny dropped and all the lights went on inside. And the machine started working. You know, nuts, 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 nuts. We used to have a little um, jukebox machine. And, and this said everything started to happen. I realised for the first time how it all worked. I'd worked so hard. I've been, I'd, I'd tried so much. But now it was happening. Life was forming. And 10 years since that's come, you know, and there's so much. And that the amount of transformation in the last 10 years supersedes the 30, nearly 40 years of previous. Brothers and sisters, we don't need any add-ons. God doesn't need us to get in the way of his mercy. The fellowship of his sufferings, that I might die to self and surrender to do his will. And learning to die to self and live for God is part of that journey of implementing what it means to come into the resurrection life of our Lord Jesus Christ. That I may attain to the resurrection from death, become the new person that Jesus has promised that I could become. That I am in the flesh 
as I am in my spirit. And the trouble with the Christian is that this, the soulish reality of our identity is still so fleshly. But the spirituality of our, our identity as Christians is perfect in every way. And Paul says, oh death, oh death, where is your sting? Physical death, brothers and sisters, is not the end of the journey. When you die and your body leaves, uh, fails to have the ability to function, because it's dead. You're not dead. You are more than just your flesh. You are a spiritual being. You are a soul being. You have a mind, emotions and a will. And God communes with you in your spirit. Paul says, not that I've already obtained, become perfect. Perfection in our humanity is a journey. Sanctification. But in our spirits, brothers and sisters, you are perfect. I want you to say that. In my spirit, I am perfect. In my spirit, I am perfect. If this was not so, God's spirit couldn't come and live in you. I remember waking up from the night time and I got up and I sat on my bed and saw myself in the mirror. Apart from being scared of what I saw. <laughs> I saw myself in the mirror and instantly the Lord brought to mind a scripture from the Old Testament. And he asked me a question about being unclean. And he said to me, Paul, can I live in that which is unclean? And I said to God, no. And I knew the Old Testament scripture. And I saw him. And he just rubbed his little chin. He didn't have a beard, but he rubbed his little chin. He rubbed his little chin like that. And I saw him. And he said, And yet I live in you. And yet I live in you. And it threw me into a tizz was really, because I thought to myself, Oh no, I've still got to become good enough. I've still got to be perfect. And he showed me, and I've developed and understood since that time. Paul, if you wasn't perfect in spirit, I couldn't live there. But where does the Holy Spirit live? He lives in your spirit. So there's no need to strive anymore. That's not to say that your soul is completely compliant to what's going on in your spirit. But there's a journey to go on. And he began to teach me how to go on this journey. <coughs> and yet I live in you. I press on, says Paul. Paul is taking hold of his inheritance that has been won for him in Christ. Faith, he sends off to work every day to take hold of his inheritance. And there are many Christians that think they just have to pray the prayer of repentance and then just kind of, they've got their ticket and they're waiting for it all to go explosive. But brothers and sisters, let me tell you, it won. It won. You have to send your faith off to work Every day, every day. It's a living faith that God has given us in our relationship with him. Oh, we don't need to repent every day of the new conversion experience. But we need to send our faith off to work, to enter into the fullness of the inheritance that God has given to us in Christ, the victory of the resurrection. He says, one thing I do by faith, forgetting what lies behind all, oh, such a preach I can give there. Forgetting what lies behind. As yeast is from the West, God forgives us of our transgressions. God takes away the unrighteousness of our journey. <clears throat> Everything that has happened to you has formed you. And all the forming of you that's negative is reproducing itself in you, in your nature and character and your life decisions. And God doesn't want you to be the person you are based upon the things that happen to you. God's wanting you to be who you are based upon his new nature that he has put within you. You're not controlled by your old nature anymore. You have been given a new nature where you can live as a child of God, reflective of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, reaching forward, to what lies ahead. 
Jesus prayed the prayer, pray the bread of tomorrow today. We can enter into the inheritance of the saints. We don't have to wait to get to heaven to enter into the fullness of the blessings of all that God has got for us. We can take hold of the inheritance of what's to come in heaven, now on earth. If we send our faith off to work in the means by which God has given to bring about the changes that need to play, take place in the soul reality of our lives. He says, I press on towards the goal for the prize. The upward call of God in Christ Jesus is life in eternity with God. Do you know that you are going to heaven having given your life to Jesus. If you are still questioning, you don't know. You need to know that God has saved you. Having worked with the Holy Spirit who brings us into sanctification. The journey for the Christian while they live on the earth is to die to self and live for God. And everything that represents you and your old nature needs to die. And your new nature needs to live in you. And the only way it can start is if you learn to send your faith off to work in the revelations that the Holy Spirit has revealed to us from the Scriptures. God has shown us how to get cleaned up. He's shown us. He's told us what we need to do. It's, I sent the Word into the world to save you. And the word is Jesus. The word become flesh and dwelt among men. It's not just the initial salvation that we step into in order to reconnect to God from the brokenness and relationship that Adam led us into. But it's the salvation of the victory of the resurrection that Jesus has won for us that's going to be our inheritance in the heaven that we're going to one day when our body gives up and we can no longer stay here. He says, all who are mature those who have this attitude while they live on the earth. We are in this world, brothers and sisters, but we are not of this world. We belong to another place. We belong, like Lot, his soul was in turmoil when Sodom and Gomorrah received the punishment because all that was amongst him was so non-reflective of God. And we are in these days in a world which is so non-reflective of God. And even more so, the decay presses in like a flood. And who does God look to in order to redeem this great last harvest, which is going to be the greatest harvest that ever existed in all of humanity? Who does God look to? He looks to the children of God, the church of Jesus Christ, and how will they see and know that this salvation is available to them? Because the church of Jesus Christ, the children of God, are living in the victory of the resurrection of the freedom that the gospel brought into their being. Walk according to the pattern you have seen in us. For many walk of whom I have often told you, I now tell you even with weeping, that they have become enemies of the cross of Christ. They, have, they are preaching a different gospel. And many have been listening to a different gospel. A gospel of add-ons. Our Jesus died for our sins and by grace and our faith in him we have entered into this new relationship with him. Why were they able, I ask? Why were they able, I ask? Did they able to turn away from the truth, Paul? Why did they turn away from the, from the truth? Because their God was their appetites. They were driven by their appetites. They kept their minds fixed on earthly things. They were conformed to this world as opposed to being transformed. They did not allow their souls to be transformed. They resisted every prompting of the Holy Spirit's inspiration upon their lives to change. They would not die to self. They lived for self. They would not surrender to me. 
They would not obey my word. They would not walk in my ways. They would not listen to me. Therefore, they could not enter into the fullness of their inheritance. And they got distracted because their focus was on their appetites. What they thought and what they felt and what they wanted. <coughs> they desired and so they took. And they re-inherited a nature that was of a nature that was not dissimilar to Adam's when he first sinned. Even having been a Christian, they gave themselves over to the deeds of darkness all over again. And the enemy seduced them. And Peter tells us that it's like the, the, the dog that returns to the vomit and the pig to the, to, to, to the pig swipe, swell. Sty. Sty. <laughs> swell. <laughs> Thank you. He says, walk according to the pattern you've seen in us. Why were they? Because they went back. Brothers and sisters, our citizenship is in heaven. That's why we all also eagerly wait for the Saviour, Maranatha, our Lord Jesus. Maranatha. Maranatha. Come, Lord Maranatha. Jesus, come. come. When he comes, will he find us like Paul, hidden in Christ? Or will we stand before him and say to him, look what we did for you. Look what we, we tried. Look, look what I've done. Look, if we come in like that, we're lost. Brothers and sisters, unless we say, I'm hidden in Jesus, my, my faith is in Jesus, my confidence is in Jesus. We have lost our sight of the truth of the gospel. He will transform our body, our lowly condition, with all its limitations and decay, into a conformity to his glorious body. God is going to give us a new body. We will stand here today glorifying that day. In all the angst and pains of life, mm -hmm. God has given us a new body to inherit, to live in his precious heaven. The completion of our sanctification when he comes looking for us will be there. The blessing of this new, perfect, eternal body. How will he do this, Paul? By the exertion of the power of that he has to subject all things unto himself. Mm. Make no mistakes. Mm. Make no mistakes. He is King of Kings and he is Lord of Lords. Amen. The war or rebellion of evil is already over as far as God is concerned. When he said, It is finished. It was finished. That day was D-Day. D-Day came when he went to the cross. And yes, we've been in a period of time and we are waiting for VE Day. And they tell me that more people, which you probably know this, they tell me that more people died in, in D-Day to VE Day than all the other time. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but that's what I've been heard. And many have lost their way during this journey. And we are waiting for V Day, now and after, come Lord Jesus. But on that day, every knee will bow down mm. to Jesus. And every knee, brothers and sisters, will confess Him as Lord. Amen. Amen. Mr. Richard Smith, would you come and finish for me? Amen. Amen. Uh, let's, uh, let's pray as we finish. Um, Father, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for the way it helps us uh, see you. And seeing you is to see your glory. And seeing your glory is the way to salvation and forgiveness. Mm. And Lord, I pray that as we go out this week, that we reflect some of that glory in the world that we live in, uh, so that others will see you through us. Amen. Amen. And amen. amen.